Hi everyone, my name is Jessica. I'm the creator of Once Upon a Pesto. Today we're gonna be meeting with a woman over in England, in the United Kingdom. Her name is Helena, and we're gonna be talking all about the food and the recipes and the culture of this country. And like I said, um, Helena is gonna be join us shortly. I'm gonna invite her up on stage and we're gonna begin this exciting conversation about the food over in England, in the wonderful uh, area of the United Kingdom. And so Helena is going to be joining us shortly. I'm just going to invite her up, and there she is. Hello, Helena. How are you? Hello. I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining us today. I was just my pleasure. Everyone, um, about you know you and and where you are. So tell us a little bit about yourself and you know what your your nationality and what got you started in your journey in cooking. Yes, well, I'd like to say hello and thank you so much for inviting me here today. You're welcome. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to join you. Um, yes, so uh, yes, I've enjoyed cooking from a very young age. Um, uh, I live in the southwest of England uh, on the ex estuary, which is in Devon. And most of my family come from this area, um, which is a beautiful part of the country. And uh, yes, I've enjoyed cooking um, with my mother and grandmother, uh, who are both good cooks uh, in the kitchen from a, from a young age. And um, then I got to apply my passion for cooking in my 20s, where I worked as a cook on luxury super yachts in um, the Caribbean and also the south of France. So that was a sort of baptism of fire, really, in the sense that it wasn't just, you know, cooking interesting recipes for um, various people, the rich and famous, but also I had to sort of budget, work under pressure, um, deal with special, special dietary requirements and, and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, so that was a great experience. Um, yeah, so... Uh, but my actual job now is um, I'm a veterinary recruitment consultant, so I find vet surgeons jobs um, from abroad and in the UK jobs all over, over the country. And um, in my spare time, I like to work on my Instagram page and um, do in interesting recipes and uh, follow my passion for cooking. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's, it's so neat to hear, you know, kind of what started your journey in cooking and your passion for food and what an experience, you know, to be cooking for so many different people working under that pressure and problem solving. I'm sure it's taught you a lot of skills. Yeah, I know. It was great fun. And, and, and I really enjoyed it. And it's, um, I mean, the positive thing that's come out of, of COVID and lockdown is that I had that time to kind of get back into to cooking interesting recipes and things. Great. And, and tell us a little bit about, you know, your country, you kind of situated at us geographically where you are. Um, so England and, and your Instagram itself is Helena's Kitchen by the Sea. So this idea of that coastal life, you know, tell us a little bit about that and how that, you know, the, the access to the sea incorporates into what you do cooking wise. Yes, yes. So um, I live very close to um, the ex estuary, which is literally like one minute down the road from me. Um, and then the sea is just at the mouth of the estuary, which is five minutes away. So uh, I'm very close to the water, which is absolutely lovely. But also, we have the sort of green rolling classic English fields um, nearby and Dartmoor, which is beautiful. So we, we have both access to um, wonderful seafood, and also um, uh, fabulous meat. So all locally produced meat down the road and uh, at the butchers here. Um, and locally caught fish that um, just down the road you can you can buy fresh from the boats on the beach. Wow! <laughs> so <laughs> it's a lovely it's a lovely part of the country country to live in. I mean, I used to live in London, and it's um, such a contrast, but mm -hmm. such a, such a good quality of life here. Definitely. And it, would you say you know compared to London, is it a slower pace of life, or still kind of similar? 
much slower pace of life. Uh, I occasionally go back to visit friends in London, but it's nice for a couple of days and then I want to come back here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, but uh, it, it's getting busier here now because of COVID. Um, a lot of people are deciding to move out of the big cities mm -hmm. um, and, and get a better quality of life uh, down in places like Devon and Cornwall and out of the city. Definitely yeah. makes sense, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so, you know, the first thing that I think of um, when I think of England and, you know, traditional uh, dish or, or meal that's served there is fish and chips. So, we're, you know, we're talking about the sea and um, how, how big of a role does that dish play in the culture over there? Um, it plays a massive role, actually. Um, I would say it's one of probably the most traditional takeaway meals in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, still people refer to Fish Friday, which obviously mm -hmm. has, has Jewish roots and traditions. In fact, I think it was actually brought to the UK by a Jewish immigrant um, in 1863. And he opened the first fish and chip shop in um, North London. Huh. So, um, and then it kind of spread to the north of England and so on. So, yes, it plays a massive role. And at one point, there was about 35,000 chip shops, fish and chip takeaway shops in the UK. Wow. So it's, yeah, it's, it's still very, very popular. And, you know, some people will traditionally go and have fish and chips every Friday, but quite a lot of people just have it from time to time because it's quite a heavy meal. But mm. um, it's definitely something, and it's a lovely thing that we do here is, you know, you go and buy it from the takeaway, go and eat it by the water, um, traditionally wrapped up in paper. And when I was younger, it used to be um, newspaper. So, oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, recent, recent publication or kind of how, how, how many months or years back would that be? Oh, <laughs> well, don't want really to show my age too much, but <laughs> no, no, not no. Age, but the, the newspaper, would they take like the prior day or like, like oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, normally it would be maybe that week or something like that, yes, okay. or they've been collecting maybe collecting over that month or something, yes, so. But it used to be quite messy because, I mean, nowadays the, the print on the paper doesn't come off on your, the ink doesn't come off on your hands, but, but then you would be eating your fish and chips and, and your hands would get black and things. So, <laughs> so yeah, so quite, quite a unique experience. Definitely, yes. And, and it's such a cool cu cultural experience too. You know, you're reading the newspaper, you're eating the fish and chips, you're probably sitting in a park or something like that because of the, the, the different locations and how many you said there are. That is fascinating. Yes, exactly. I mean, those those figures are like when it was its, its peak in the UK. Now it's probably a little bit less, but nevertheless, it's it's a very much instilled in the in the English culture, you know. And and typically, you might say to you know friends or family, "Oh, let's meet and and grab some fish and chips, and you know, take them to the by the sea or to the park or whatever." Yeah, very neat. <laughs> what other, Helena, uh, other dishes are kind of those those big um, in, in terms of popularity, you know, throughout history, but also relevant to today throughout the country? So I would say another big thing is the English roast, mm. um, the, 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 the roast uh, dinner, they call it, um, that, that we have on Sunday afternoons. Um, and that is still very much uh, instilled in the British culture. Um, yes, I mean, it, traditionally, I think it began when people used to go historically to church on Sundays and they would put the joint of meat in the oven. And by the time they got back from church, the, the, the meat would be ready um, with the sort of juices that came out of the meat um, mm -hmm. with all the roast vegetables and so on. So... That is very much still uh, a, a, most most families or most uh, people will have a roast on on Sunday afternoon, 
And traditionally it was roast beef because it, it started off being sort of more of a, a wealthy person's meal. But of course, then it became popular and grew like a lot of these things, uh, traditions. So um, traditionally used to be roast beef because obviously being a country with loads of grass and cattle and sheep, it, with a, you know, there's lots of beef. So, um, but nowadays people will, even if it's just a roast chicken that they, they get, they will have a roast with a roast chicken and sometimes uh, roast pork um, with crackling. And crackling is the skin of the, the, the pig okay. that you crisp up and you put salt on it and make it get really crispy. And, and that's a typical thing that people will have the, the crunchy skin of the pork with the roast pork um, on a Sunday, for example, with the roast potatoes, the roast vegetables, the Yorkshire pudding. Uh-huh. So quite, quite a heavy meal. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you're not in the mood for a heavy meal, it's not the best thing, but um, you know, because we have quite um, bad weather mm. <laughs> and, and it rains a lot, it's, it's quite a nice comforting thing sometimes to have, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. Yes, for sure. Uh, we're expecting some rain today and I'm just thinking, you know, that it sounds just perfect and cozy and yeah. <laughs> uh, whereabouts are you exactly? I'm in Pennsylvania, so in the northeast of the United States, close to New York. Oh, Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Yes, I, I visited there once. It's a really nice part of, of the States, isn't it? Mm -hmm, it is. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting. I want to see, you know, when you came here and in your other travels and, and past jobs, what, what stood out to you as, as distinguishable in, in your country in England versus elsewhere in the world? Food wise. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, what I will say is our recipes tend to be quite heavy. Mm. Um, if you're comparing them with say Asian food or, um, other other food whether it's mediterranean food and things like that mm -hmm. um but that's partly to, to do with our sort of um our climate and uh, and i think also a lot of the traditional recipes were invented to to sort of fuel people when they mm -hmm. they had a sort of you know a heavy day's work ahead of them or or whatever and going back to the fish and chips um in the first and second world war uh they they had rationing with food but they didn't ration the fish and chips because they felt like it was uh a very important part of the diet and it gave you energy and nutrients and it was like a sort of national institution so it was never rationed during the war um and yes i mean you certainly notice i i've lived some time in spain i lived about eight years in spain and and when I moved back to the UK, I did notice that, yes, oh, some of the, the food's quite um, sort of heavy and things. But nowadays, I mean, it does have a reputation for being a little bit maybe stodgy and bland. But mm -hmm. it's certainly not like that because uh, lots of sort of gastronomic variations have been made on the traditional recipes these days. And, you know, if you visit London, uh, it's, you'll probably get one of the biggest choices in the world um, of different varieties of food because it's so such a multicultural society now here in the UK. Yeah. What are, the, what are the main influences that you see in terms of, you know, other international cuisines in, in, in the area, you know, in terms of restaurants, you know, here in the United States, the biggest I would say is probably Chinese or Italian. Um, what okay. kind of influences yeah. like that do you see in restaurants? Uh, curry houses are a big, big thing. Um, so, so Indian food, mm -hmm. um, and obviously that was part to do with, you know, historically with, with the sort of British empire and the influences coming over from, from, from India. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's quite typical that say, um, on a Friday night or at the weekend, people will either go and eat in a curry house after they've been out uh, for the evening at the end of the night or they will get an Indian takeaway. 
or, you know, curries become a very almost part of the traditional British food. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been adapted to uh, the English palate. So, so, so the sort of Indian and Pakistani immigrants that, that live here uh, have adapted it to the English taste. So, you know, a, a, an English person that likes a milder curry might have a korma, but they like mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a slightly more medium one, it would be tikkan tikka, tikka masala. <laughs> and people that um, perhaps are a bit more aficionados with, with Indian food will be bolder and go for a madras or a vindaloo or, or something like that. So, yeah, I would say Indian takeaway, it's a, or not just takeaway, Indian uh, curry houses are all over the country and it's definitely very much part of our culture wow yeah yeah uh chinese also but indian definitely is is a big thing okay that's awesome mm -hmm. and and i never you know would have expected that kind of um broad you know kind of presence in the country um so Elena, I want to kind of switch switch gears here. Let's go back to, we talked about some of the big dishes, you know, d different influences. Let's go to the start of the day, because I know the English breakfast is oh, yes. special. <laughs> so tell us about that. <laughs> yes, well, the English breakfast. Um, so the full traditional English breakfast uh, typically consists of uh, sausages, bacon, eggs, beans, mushrooms, tomato, uh, buttered toast or, or fried bread. Uh, so again, a big meal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but very, very tasty. Mm -hmm. And um, traditionally it was uh, eaten by sort of the upper classes, you know, when there used to be more of a class system in, in the country okay. or the gentry, gentry at weekends and things. And if they 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 were out in the country and they wanted a, something to keep them going when they went shooting or something, they would have the the traditional English breakfast. But then in the Victorian um, era, the middle classes sort of became wealthier and they started having the traditional English breakfast. And then it kind of with the Industrial Revolution, it then um, spread into the sort of working lower classes. And um, since then, um, sort of laborers and people that work really hard will often have that type of breakfast every day wow. because they need it for um, fuel to work, really. Yeah. Um, and yes, so, but uh, nowadays, most average people will just have it, say, occasionally at the weekend mm -hmm. as, as a treat on a Saturday or Sunday or kind of as a brunch, which is obviously between breakfast and lunch. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps then only have two meals in the day. But yes, I mean, you can find the traditional English breakfast in most uh, cafes and hotels and pubs and, and some restaurants and they serve it all day um and and if you you go abroad you can you can often find it too <laughs> yes that's for sure <laughs> so what on those those other days you know what is a um a breakfast encompass if it's not the typical english breakfast well, if it's not the typical English breakfast, um, there is also something else which is quite typically English, but it's not so um, typical, if you like, uh -huh. which we have is called kippers, which is, is very, very English. Um, and it's smoked herring uh, fish. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, it's not that, you know, some people occasionally have it. Um, it was quite popular when I was a child and my mother used to give it to me quite a lot. Um, <laughs> and you will have this, the fish with the bread and butter. And it was uh, invented by a man in Northumberland that, that worked in a, in, in a smokehouse and he left the fish there overnight. And I think maybe accidentally ended up smoking this herring and then kippers were invented. But backtracking a bit, that's not such a typical um, breakfast day to day for okay. English people. I mean, a lot of people that are working will perhaps 
have a piece of toast or cereal or uh, and a cup of tea or coffee uh, or yogurt and fruit. Uh, and in the winter months, uh, perhaps uh, porridge or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so to keep them warm in the colder, darker mornings. Uh -huh. So, so yes, so we, we don't eat English breakfast every day, typically, unless, you know, we're going to do some seriously hard work or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some extra energy in that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So, so yes. Uh, so kippers and English breakfast. Yes. I mean, there is some, um, also something that, that, that my mother used to give me, which, uh, a lot of the sort of uh, you can find different recipes on these days online, which is an influence from India as well, mm. uh, which is called kedgeri, uh, which was brought over from the Indian influence to the UK, uh, which is rice, smoked haddock, eggs uh, and curry powder. And again, it's sort of a bit like maybe perhaps the sort of Indian version of uh, cooked breakfast. Mm -hmm. Where it's that kind of biggish meal that, you know, keeps you going if you need to keep it you going a bit more than just your average breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my mother used to, f to to make all these things for me So when I was growing up. So I had sort of quite an e eclectic breakfast mix, if you like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so neat, though. You know, it, it just adds to your knowledge, your experience, and that kind of you know, how you want to pursue cooking when you grew older. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, yes, it was, you know, it was really interesting to, to, to try all these different things. And, yes, like you say, uh, it's given me a passion to try lots of different dishes and, and experiment with them too. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so. <laughs> but, what, um, what would you say was, is your your favorite traditional English dish to to make? You know, one that you always look forward to or make most often still to this day. I I would say um, I would say fish and chips. Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, I know it's very easy to to, to get them from um, the fish and chip shop or even you know in restaurants, but. Proper homemade fish and chips is it. You can't beat it. <laughs> how often, and how it, often do people make it at home? I'm sure it's not not that at the common. No, it's not. It's not that typical to make at home um, for a lot of people. Um, uh, but I I really enjoy making it home because obviously the, the the chips are a lot fresher. You can make your own fresh batter get fresh fish um and it, it tastes great and particularly if you make the batter with um half lager half flour mm. it makes it really really crispy so yeah it's really good um because if you buy it from the fish and chip takeaway sometimes it can get really soggy mm. uh, and so on but but also another a dish that i like making and have actually made very consistently over the years is curry okay so i do i do like to make um curry uh sort of medium strength uh, madras curry so yeah and that could be a chicken or a prawn curry uh which is great if you know if you have a cold as well because mm -hmm. with all the spices and so on so yeah and I do understand from your Instagram that you are a fan of oysters. So tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I really enjoy oysters. Um, and I, I've, I've enjoyed seafood a lot over the years. And, um, yeah, I have a passion for oysters. Uh, we don't tend to have so many as you have in the states i think because oh. you have a lot in the states <laughs> don't you <laughs> and um but um yes i've i've I really enjoyed them on and off over the years and i've got more into them say the last couple of years i always had a tradition with my friend uh, when i lived in spain which was we always met up at our birthdays and we had oysters from france Aww. or whatever and um 
But yes, I, I, I do really love oysters. And, you know, when I get the chance to have them, particularly by the sea, um, it's, it's one of my favourite things. Uh, a lot of people, you know, it's not their cup of tea. <laughs> uh-huh. but, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something I enjoy when I get the chance. And, you know, we have, we have some, some very nice ones here um, in, in Cornwall, uh, the quite famous Portilli ones. And, uh, yeah, and Porlock ones, which are, are not far away in North Devon. So, you know, I, I enjoy the local ones from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And you mentioned, you know, not your cup of, or not other people's cup of tea. So speaking of tea and drinks, how does, um, you know, uh, tea throughout the day kind of take us through the different drinks or desserts that are part of English um, culture, food culture? Yeah, so... Uh, so tea, yes, tea is a big, big, um, a big thing in the UK, and um, that's the first drink I have in, have in the morning. Really, you know, if I if I want to sort of wake myself up, I'm having a cup of tea, <laughs> and then and then later on, sort of mid morning, I'll move into the coffee and, and things like that. But but yeah, so most British people, I would say, probably more um, uh, people in England. Uh, love a cup of tea in in the morning and um you know usually it's it's a typical thing within in the english culture that that you will say amongst uh, friends or family or, or loved ones that um oh every uh, a cup of tea fixes everything so <laughs> so you know if there's if there's an argument or a problem or or a drama you know they say oh I'll just go and make a cup of tea. <laughs> and so, well, yeah, it usually does work, yeah, to calm everyone down. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's very, very typical. And, um, you know, say in, in my job, um, in the office or whatever, you say you're going to go and make a drink and usually you'll be making a, a cup of tea um so it's more typical in our culture than say obviously the mediterranean cultures where Mm -hmm. coffee is more typical um so yeah so i would say yes i mean the typical drinks are say tea uh people will have coffee but not as much as tea um and then in the afternoon obviously tea time Mm -hmm. at at three or four o'clock um that again is a big thing within in in the UK um, and England. Uh, so you'll have also a thing that's very typical to where I live in the West Country are scones, and that's called a cream tea. Hmm. Uh, which um, yeah, so they're basically um, they're like little plain plain little cakes. Of a, you can get them; um, they are savoury, or you can have cheese scones. Okay. And and you have them with clotted cream, which comes from this part of uh, the country as well, and jam. And you have a, a Devon cream tea and you have a Cornish cream tea. And clotted cream comes from the local cows and it's like... Um, it's, it's like a, a sort of uh, thick cream with a crusty top and you spread it on your fresh scone mm. and you put jam on top. That's the Devon way. So that's where I live. <laughs> but, but the Cornish who live down the road say, oh, no, 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 no. You, you put the jam on first, then the cream. Ah. So it gets quite competitive. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and, and what about, you know, an after meal kind of dessert? Is that, you know, like, like um, here in the States, you know, you, you're thinking pie, ice cream, cake, uh, cookies, things like that. Is that something that in, um, in British culture is done? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. People like their puddings. Um, and you know, it can vary from, like you say, it could vary from anything like apple pie, Mm. uh, ice cream. Trifle is a very, um, Mm. typical, uh, British, uh, English, um, dish. Uh, What is it? Yeah. Yeah, so trifle is, um, I think it kind of originated because people wanted to use over leftover cake. So you've got sponge fingers, sponge fingers or leftover plain vanilla cake, 
that you make a layer of and you uh, then have it with sherry or brandy. So you soak the um, the the sponge in in alcohol, so sherry or brandy typically, but you don't have to have an alcoholic one. Um, and then it has a layer of uh, jelly and custard and cream. So it has these layers and it's quite light compared to say like a pie, apple pie or mm. something. And you can you can find it in a lot of places. Usually, a lot of the supermarkets, the places will will stock um, trifle or cherry trifle. Uh, so it's very British. Uh, but I yes, I think it originated to use up the kind of leftovers. So you would have all these things like the custard that would go in and the leftover cake mm -hmm. and jelly and things like that. So yeah, so that's that's very typically British, um, and it's also um, a lighter pudding to have. At Christmas time, okay. because at Christmas time we have a thing called Christmas pudding as well, which uh, is quite a heavy pudding, and not everybody likes it. But then some people love it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you ha you make that kind of some people make it months in advance so that the, the, the flavors can develop, uh, and they put um, alcohol in it again. So that could be brandy. But it's made of dried fruits and uh, fruits and, yeah, almonds. And then you typically have it with um, brandy butter. So you have it with brandy butter on Christmas Day. And some people set fire to the the Christmas pudding. <laughs> so you'll put, some people pour brandy over it, for example, and then uh -huh. set fire to it at the table. And then, you know, half the people might go, Oh no, I can't eat that after the turkey roast dinner. I'll have a lighter pudding. <laughs> and, and other people will be like, oh yes, I'd love some, give me some. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, it's a, some people love hate relationship with the Christmas pudding. <laughs> that reminds me of the eggnog um, here in the United States. People either love it or hate it. And it's a very kind of Christmas uh, traditional uh, drink. <laughs> yeah definitely definitely yeah so so usually before christmas dinner people will say okay who likes christmas pudding you know <laughs> um, <laughs> and and for example i think it's um at the Chris, uh, our christmas dinner um last year i think there were two people out of sort of six that were going to eat it so okay you know <laughs> Every oh, year it oh. seems to get smaller and smaller. <laughs> but um yeah, I, I like it. I like it. So so yeah. But um yeah, I mean another thing I should perhaps talk about as well whilst we've been talking about tea mm -hmm. are sandwiches. So sandwiches are a really big thing within the British culture and um a big meal in terms of it's very typical to have a sandwich at lunchtime mm. and uh it was invented by the earl of sandwich so <laughs> in um, the 18th century and i think he was playing cards or something and he didn't want to get up from the table and he was hungry mm -hmm. so he was brought this beef um, between two pieces of bread, and then the sandwich was invented. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but um, and it's a massive thing. It's like a multi-million-pound um, industry now within within the British British culture because you know traditionally you might just have a cheese and pickle sandwich or a ham sandwich or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then when I was growing up, something like a, a prawn mayonnaise sandwich was probably quite exciting. And now, you know, that's quite boring in comparison <laughs> to all the different <laughs> options that you can get. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I mean, now, you know, you go into some supermarkets and it's just an absolute sea or, or, or you know, good cafes and you get so many options of different sandwiches. And typically we have, have a sandwich at lunchtime. Okay. Um, you know, because uh, a lot of people are kind of on the move or if they're working in an office, so they'll grab a sandwich, which, you know, um, is handy sometimes. But, you know, on the other hand, having lived 
in the Mediterranean culture, I do like that kind of you take a bit of time, you stop, mm -hmm. you eat. Um, <laughs> kind of pause but, with but, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but also uh, you get sort of afternoon teas where typically you say would have cakes, scones and sandwiches mm. with the afternoon tea and a big pot of tea and that they will serve in um, hotels, good restaurants and it's become quite a big thing. Uh, historically it was called high tea but now you know if you want to go out with you know friends or loved ones or family and you want to do something special you would go out and have a, a special afternoon tea or something like that. Okay. I like the combination you know sweet and savory whichever palate uh, pleases everyone. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, and, you know, a lot of people do it as sort of birthday treats or something like that. Or, you know, it could be anything from going to, to the local um, restaurant in the afternoon or the hotel to going to the Ritz for high tea or, or whatever. Very neat. This has been all so wonderful. Uh, this conversation has been a blast with you, Helena. I, I appreciate your time. Um, the one thing I, I, I want to encourage people, you know, if you're watching it now in the moment, if you'll be watching it after, is to comment, ask some questions, you know, tag us, tag Helena. Uh, she'd be happy to answer. And the last question I have for you, Helena, is, is what, um, how, how can people follow you and where can we um, see your recipes and engage with you? Yes, yeah, so um, I have an Instagram page called Helena's uh, underscore kitchen underscore by underscore the sea. <laughs> um, so you can find me there. Um, I have been away for the last month, so uh, I've not sort of been in my usual routine. Um, but you can find me, follow me there and find my recipes there. And um, I'm, I'll be doing some more English recipes on there to come very soon. So watch that space. Awesome. We are so excited to see those. And uh, again, Elena, I appreciate your time. This has been such a wonderful conversation. It's, it's morning here, it's afternoon there. Uh, but just you know, regardless of time, it's, it's been great learning more about the culture, the food, the recipes, you know, those traditional dishes like fish and chips, the high tea, um, everything, you know, the influences from India. It's just all so fascinating. So thank you so much for sharing, for your expertise and, and your passion for cooking. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jessica. I've really enjoyed it and it's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day, Elena. And you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.